Um, we are in Ephesians in chapter number 4, but uh, perhaps we could read a couple of verses before we get there. The first of them is back in the, at the beginning of your Bible, back in 2 Samuel. Uh, 2 Samuel, a rather obscure couple of verses, but we trust that uh, we might to make use of them as we work through Ephesians 4. 2 Samuel and chapter number 5. Uh, and the background, by the way, is that David has uh, been enthroned and uh, uh, the uh, nation of Israel has been united and rallied and, well, where there's success, there's going to be undesired attention. And it comes from the Philistines. Uh, they hear about this king uh, in their land, their territory, and uh, they're, of course, enraged. And if you look at verse 17 of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, but when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold. And just down to about verse number 22, and the Philistines came up uh, yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them. Go behind them and come up. Upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until that thou come to Gaza. So David had been established as king. God had promised him the kingdom. In fact, not only did he promise him the kingdom, but he had promised the kingdom to his son. Uh, so that was pretty sure that that kingdom was stand. The, the, the outcome of the war, the outcome of the, the, the war was, was certain and sure. But uh, during that period, there would be many battles fought, just as your life and my life uh, would follow that pattern. The outcome of your life and my life, if we trust the Lord Jesus, is certain and sure. There's just no ifs, buts, nor maybes about it. I give unto my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. And if you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and received that gift of eternal salvation, you are secure, secure forever. And uh, to that extent, I would be as Calvinistic as Mr. Calvin. The eternal security of the believer, unshakable, unmovable, held in the hands of the Lord Jesus, and for added measure, in the hands of the Father. You can never be lost if you know Christ as Saviour. But during that period of your life, there will be many battles. Battles that could be lost and battles that could be won. And here, are one, here is uh, one of the many battles that David fought. And you're aware, as I'm aware, uh, sadly, that sometimes he lost battles. But uh, here's one that he won. And in winning that battle, he had to be sensitive. Sensitive to the movement of God. He wasn't going to just go on his own initiative and fight the Philistines. He's going to just wait, just to see a movement of the Spirit of God. Just watch out for the, the top of those mulberry trees. And once you see that little rustling in the top of the mulberry trees, then I want you to move. Because I've moved first. God's moved first. And once God moves, you move. And then there's victory. Just that sensitivity to the Spirit of God. And David was spot on there in being sensitive to a movement. Of the Spirit of God. So God first of all declares in the little thing what he's going to do in the big thing. Just the movement on the mulberry trees and then he'll decimate the Philistines. But we have to be sensitive. Well, that's a lesson there in Second Samuel. Now over please into the book of Galatians just for a wee verse that we might make reference to uh, later on. Uh, Galatians and uh, well we'll read the two verses actually that we might make mention of. So Galatians chapter 1 verse number 6. I marvel, says Paul, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. Well, that's the foundation of your faith, isn't it? The gospel. <laughs> the old preachers, they used to summarise the gospel as man's ruin, God's remedy and our responsibility. Uh, that's good. Man's ruin, that's our sin, we're fallen. That's the very core of the gospel, isn't it? That's why we need the gospel. Man's ruin and God's remedy, that's the cross. It's what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our response to that, the, 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 the very essence of the gospel, that's our foundation. And, and they've shifted from it. And this is in the very early days, you know, the very early days of, the, of the, the good news of the Lord Jesus. You know, there are groups of people today that call themselves orthodox. 
because they can trace back their history to the very beginning. That's not a very safe thing to be able to claim orthodoxy, because just within a few years of the death of the Lord Jesus, orthodoxy had become apostasy. Be very, very careful, because you can trace yourself back 2,000 years. But if you don't trace yourself back to the word of God and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're no more orthodox than any of the modern heretics. And there it is there in Galatians 1. They're already, some of them, they're already drifted from the fact that they're sinners and Christ died for their sins and it's their only hope of salvation and there's a response that's needed. Now, let's go over then to where we ought to be, which is Ephesians chapter number 4, please. And we want to think this evening a little bit about this second picture of the church. We'll read from the beginning of Ephesians chapter 4, shall we? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, even as you're called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do come into thy presence uh, this evening with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, for this great work that is the church and this wonderful picture that we have before us. Help us, our Father, just to appreciate something of the greatness and the glory and the gra grandeur of that which the Lord Jesus Christ is doing and has done. And we pray, Father, that we might be drawn closer even again to the Saviour and uh, just know our dependence upon him. And we pray, Father, that thou would bless the work of God here in New Cumnock and round about, that thou would add to thy church and build us up together in Christ. And we really pray, Father, uh, that thou would richly uh, bless the word of God amongst us this evening as we offer thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Robert, in his prayer, was making mention of uh, some of the problems that are in the world uh, for the church, uh, the very issue of martyrdom, which was very much in my mind, I'm afraid, here in Ephesians chapter number 4. It has been said, and I'm sure it must be true, that there were more martyrs in the Christian church in the 20th century, more martyrs than in total in the last two thousand years that the 20th century i don't know what the 21st is doing but uh, probably not any better maybe even worse uh, it is a, has been a time of intense persecution against the church uh, of course as you look at those various occasions when the church has been persecuted and you look at the places that they're persecuted you'll find something rather odd or something that struck me as rather odd that as you go from country to country and time to time, you'll find that Christians are attacked and persecuted for apparently very different reasons. If you were to go, for example, today to India, you would find that the church and Christians are attacked uh, because they're foreign. foreign. And one of the great cries of the nationalists in, Hin in India is India for the Hindu. India for the Hindu. You're a foreign religion and therefore because you're a foreign religion, we don't want you. But if you were to go over into some of the communist countries, uh, particularly, of course, in Russia, maybe before the sort of semi-collapse of communism, you would find that Christianity was equally persecuted and attacked, not because it was a foreign religion, but because it was a mental disorder. Now, and they thought this uh, Stalin and, and so forth sought to re-educate Christians by putting them in the gulag. There was something mentally disordered about them. That's what the problem was. 
If you go to North Korea, it's none of those problems. The real problem with Christianity is it's a security risk. And so they all have these different reasons for attacking the church. In our Western world, of course, none of those reasons apply again. It's just that apparently we're very hateful. We don't tolerate certain things and the word of God preaches against it. And so they don't like that either. Now here's something rather strange. Why is it that the church is attacked in so many ways for different reasons? Is it perhaps because all of those reasons are wrong? Now actually we miss the point that there's a reason behind all of those reasons as to why the church is being attacked. There was a little book written a number of years ago by a man called Wormbrand. Uh, Tortured for Christ, he called it, his little book. And it was his experience in Romania under Ceausescu, under the communist regime there when there was intense persecution against the church. He was imprisoned and he was tortured. And he makes an interesting statement in that little book, Tortured for Christ. His take on the persecution of the church in the communist countries is this. That the church was not being persecuted because it was a mental problem or because it was a security risk or because it was foreign. Oh no. His take on it is this. That the whole communist regime was actually a spiritual force with merely a political veneer. That's interesting. His, His thought was this. That basically what was happening in the world was it was an attempt to control the minds and hearts of men and women. And the politics and the finances were just a veneer to the whole thing. The real core issue was something spiritual, attacking the very soul of men and women, demanding their obedience and uh, and demanding the obliteration of God, and in particular the name of Christ. And of course, as you come to Ephesians 4, that rings so true, so true. Because what we have here in the Ephesian epistle, of course, is the establishment of the church. And what we have here is this church, and it's, in a sense, it is arising. It's arising in the face of demonic powers. Do you remember that those who constitute this church in Ephesians chapter number 4 are the same people who were plucked from Satan in Ephesians chapter number 2? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. In a sense, Christ stole all of these people from the very grips of Satan and placed them in his church. And as that church is being established, it stands as testimony against the powers of hell itself. Ephesians Chapter number 3, verse number 10. This is, what, this is what you and I, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are constantly declaring before Satan by our very existence. Ephesians 3, verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers. There's various dimensions of satanic forces. To the intent now that unto principalities and powers and heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So the the whole spiritual domain round about us sees that God is doing something wonderful through his son. Now the angelic powers are delighted by that. The satanic powers, the satanic powers are seeing the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. When was the beginning of the end for Satan? Was it Genesis 3? When God spoke immediately after the fall that he would indeed bring the seed of the woman. Maybe that was the beginning of the end. In a sense it was. Was the beginning of the end for Satan the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I think Satan possibly thought that as he attempted to eradicate all the children from the nation. You remember that? Murder them all. He could see the beginning of the end. Or was the beginning of the end at the cross? Or was the beginning of the end at the resurrection? Well, you could pick various points, but this I know for certain. The testimony, the perpetual testimony of the beginning of the end for Satan is the church. Because it continues to exist as testimony to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so for 2,000 years, Satan has constantly thrown against the church. So much so that the word... The word that uh, is uh, the word really for testimony or witness 
The word for witness, originally the word for witness, the Greek word for witness, becomes the English word for martyr. Marturo is the Greek word for witness. And imperceptibly in the New Testament, it suddenly changes its meaning from just meaning witness to meaning those killed for Christ. Why? Because the cost and the consequences of standing as a witness to the Lord Jesus was almost inevitably death. And so the witness becomes a martyr. And there in Ephesians, uh, we have this great testimony. Uh, the great testimony, in a sense, uh, there that stands uh, uh, reminding Satan every second of the day that his days are numbered. That the pit has been dug, metaphorically speaking. That bottomless pit has been measured. And he's about to be cast into it. You'll read about it at the end of the book of Revelation. And in a sense there will be a gravestone that will stand at the top of that pit. And upon it will be these words. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, bearing that in mind, dear Christian. That means that you and I are a most awkward bunch. Uh, it means that you and I are the most difficult group of people to Satan. We are a constant, a constant annoyance, a constant reminder of his own judgment. Can you imagine? Can you imagine every day waking up and there on your, your mobile phone, on your WhatsApp, uh, there on your, uh, your group chat or your text message, somebody sent you a message that tells you the day and the time and the date of your death. Can you imagine that? And in essence, in many ways, that is what the church is to Satan. A constant reminder of his failure and a constant reminder that the victory is being won and has been established by the Lord Jesus. Now, I say all of that for this reason uh, that that puts us in many ways in in a in a potential in a potential potentially easy for you to say Stuart, potentially vulnerable position. We're under attack, no doubt about it. We are under attack, and in this uh, uh, book of Ephesians, uh, the apostle will give me three pictures of the church, and in each of these three pictures of the church, he's going to tell me about the strength of the church. The strength of the church. The strength of the church to repel that attack. Now, again, I, I say it just, just to remind you, there is no uncertainty about the outcome of the war. That's, that's, that's for sure and that's for certain. Uh, if you belong to the Lord Jesus, you're certain. Uh, your salvation is secure in the Lord Jesus Christ and heaven is definitely your home. There's no ifs, buts, no maybes. But day by day and week by week, as believers individually and as the church collectively is concerned, we fight battles. Some of those battles you'll win. Some of them you'll lose. We'll come back to that in a minute. And the difference is in the strength. Now, in the book of Ephesians, you've got three pictures of the church. The first of them is in Ephesians chapter number 2, and it is the picture of the church that is uh, the temple. Do you remember that? If you just flick back to Ephesians chapter number 2, and just the page over there, Ephesians chapter number 2, and you've got this wonderful picture, really, of the place where we meet with God. And, uh, for example, uh, look at verse number 18, just breaking into chapter number 2. For through him we both have access by one Spirit uh, to the Father. It's a place where the Spirit of God is. And look down at the end, verse 22. In whom you also are builded together for an habitation, for a place for God to stay. An habitation of God through the Spirit. So that's what the temple was, in a sense. Or the temple was a picture of that. So you, know, you, want to go, you want to meet with God when you went to the temple, didn't you? Yeah. Well, the temples have gone now, but God may, takes up his place amongst his people collectively. I know he takes up his place in our hearts. John 14 tells me that. But he also takes up his place collectively amongst his people. It's a temple. And the temple has a strength. Something that will keep it strong and that will keep it straight and that will uh, in, in, impede the attacks of Satan and, 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 and ward off uh, uh, the, the, the damage that Satan would intend to afflict against it. And, and its strength here, so far as the temple is concerned, is its foundation. All right? Now look down there. Ephesians chapter number 2. 
Verse number 20. When it comes to the picture of the church as a temple, the, the temple is as strong and as secure as its foundation. Uh, many years ago, I was in the Gospel Hall uh, over in Larrickshire, and uh, they had to rebuild the Gospel Hall. There was a big crack appeared right in the back wall. And uh, it came to light that many years ago, the Gospel Hall had been built in the site of an old brickworks. <clears throat> And they had skimped on the foundation. They hadn't put down enough foundation. So they'd built a little foundation on top of clay. And it sunk. It was only as good as its foundation. And the crack growing week by week in the back wall declared the truth of that. So the temple is only as strong as its foundation. Ephesians 2.20 You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So if you want a church to survive and, to st and, and, and a church to grow, that is a local church anyway, we know ultimately his church will never be destroyed, but in the local uh, aspect, in the individual uh, case, if we want that church to grow and to repel the attack, it has to be founded upon the word of God. It has to be founded upon truth, drawing from the uh, apostles and the prophets, the word of God. All, of course, drawing us back to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you move from that foundation, disaster, disaster, absolute catastrophe. That's, of course, why I read that little verse in Galatians chapter number one, because sadly, uh, the church at Galatia became an illustration of that very point. Galatians 1 verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Removed from the truth of the gospel, removed from the truth of the apostles who preached the gospel, and ultimately a bit shaky about Christ. Disaster. You're just waiting for that crack to appear in the back wall now, aren't you? Well, so you should be. Once you attack the foundations, that's the strength of the church. First one. The second picture, though, is the one that we're in this evening in Ephesians chapter number 4. Because the first picture, whilst it's of a building or the temple, the second picture of the church in Ephesians chapter 4 is of a body. Now, that's different. So we're moving from a place, if you like, a temple, to a person. This is organic. This is living. This, is good. this isn't made of bricks and mortar. This is made of flesh and blood. <laughs> yeah. So Ephesians chapter number 4, um, just in case you're, 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 you're in any doubt about that, verse 4, there is one body, one body. And, and you can go down through the, the text and you'll find that that body metaphor is extended towards the end. We didn't really read it all, but you've got the joints and, and so forth in that body in verse 16. So definitely a body, definitely a body. Now, that body is also going to be under attack. It's a church. And it has a strength. This time we're not going to go down to the foundation. But don't forget about that. That's an important strength. The foundation in Christ. His apostles. The word of God. Uh, the prophets. That foundation in truth. But there's a second strength. Also important. And, and when that is weakened. You can, you, can, you, 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 you can be absolutely sure that there's disaster around the corner. The strength here is in the unity of the body. Now, that, that theme of unity runs through the whole of Ephesians 4. Look at verse number 3. Endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Verse 4. One body, one Spirit, one hope. Verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6. One God. Down there, verse 13. Till we all come in the unity. Unity, unity, one, 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 one. And so the strength when it comes to the body of the church is not now the foundation going down, but it's our connection to one another going out. Yeah. Right. Some people, you know, they... Some people are, are small in church. Small in church. I've met people that don't see the need for church. People that will tell you, you know, that, well, I'm a Christian and I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And in the sense, that's true. You don't need to go to church to be a Christian. You said, I don't have much to contribute to the church. Maybe you don't have much to contribute to the church. But I'll tell you one thing you definitely will contribute to the church. Strength. Strength. Because the strength comes through unity. And each of us brings something. Even if it's just ourselves. Although there's more. But even if it's just ourselves, there's a strength that is added just by 
our very presence. That's good. Unity. And when that is weakened, anticipate disaster. I'll give you another example of that. Galatians again. Sorry about this. Galatians, I'm very sorry about this. Oh dear Christians in Galatians seem to have a lot flung at them, don't they? But there you go, Galatians chapter 5. We've got a double problem at Galatia, sadly. Galatians 5, verse number 15. That was a place that maybe was a bit shaky on the foundation. I detect disaster. Galatians 5.15. Also, when it comes to the body, those connections with one another, there's a problem. Galatians 5.15. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. So that unity is starting to be shaken. They're having a go at one another. Many years ago, um, there was an old preacher, an old friend of mine, Willie. Willie Park, who used to come here. This was 20-odd years ago, Willie. And uh, Willie had a bad accident. He was crossing the road and got hit by a bus. And uh, he stopped driving. And so, as perhaps part of the ministry that Willie had here, he didn't only come and preach, but I had to go and collect him and bring him up. <laughs> and we used to have chats in, in the road here and the road back. He was full of stories, Willie. I remember one of the stories he told, it was of going to preach over in Lanarkshire a number of years ago. And he was preaching on this text uh, of Galatians chapter number 5. Some of these stories are just sticking your heat, as I say. Galatians 5. If you bite and devour one another. This was the text he had in mind. It's not a text I would take to a church and preach on, you know? Well, he was fearless. And that was the text he had in mind. And he didn't know anything about the church he was going to. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. And having told the story, well, he did add to me, he says, if you go back there tonight, he says, Stuart, there's nothing left because they've all eaten one another. And he went and he preached in that text and in between meetings, the, the, the friends there invited him back for something to eat. And it was a while ago because they had a coal fire. They sat down by the coal fire and the Christian that was in the church there and that had invited him for his, his meal picked up the poker for the coal fire and pointed it at Willie and says to Willie, he says, when, what tell you about the condition of this meeting, he says. What tell you about the condition of this meeting? You see, the word that, that Willie had brought was exactly where they were. They were biting and they were going to devour one another. That's what they told them. Nobody told me about the condition of the meeting. And the brother acknowledged that. He says, no. He says, nobody could, could have told you about the condition of this, this church, he said. Because you can never have preached with such freedom and liberty. The Spirit of God that brought that word. Utter catastrophe will, uh, will, 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 will ensue where we begin to break that unity. Because that's the strength of the body. The strength of the temple, the foundation, the building. The strength of the body... Our connection with one another, unity. And the third picture you've got in Ephesians is the final one of Ephesians chapter number 5. It's the picture of the bride. So you've got the building, you've got the body, and you've got the bride. Isn't that great that the apostle uh, gave us bees for them? Eh? That's good, isn't it? It helps me to remember that. And you'll remember, of course, that when you come to Ephesians chapter number 5, it's that wonderful picture of the husband and the wife. Uh, for example, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Members of his body, his flesh, his bones. Verse 32, this is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. Let the wife see that she reverence her husband. The third great strength of the church moving from the picture of the building, that's your foundation, that's the truth of the word of God, that's the revelation of the prophets, of the apostles, that takes us to Christ. The second strength is a unity. That's not going down, that's going out. That's our connection to one another. And the third strength here in Ephesians chapter number five in, in connection with the bride is our connection up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you were those three things, you've got strength. You start to weaken any of them, you've got catastrophe and disaster. Can I give you an example of perhaps where uh, a problem may have arisen in Ephesians chapter number five with the connection with Christ? I think Robert already mentioned it in prayer. 
We don't have to go out of Ephesus to find it. You find it in Revelation chapter number 2. That I will come, Revelation 2 and verse number 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. This is the ministry of John now, or the Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to, through John to Ephesus. Uh, Revelation 2, 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove the lampstand or the candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Oh dear. Sad, isn't it, that they have left their first love. Verse 4. The consequences of leaving the first love is weakness, catastrophe, and disaster. So... Ephesians uh, chapter 4 then reminds us of the central of those three great strengths as we face the attack of Satan against us. Let's very, very briefly, just for the uh, last few minutes, just notice uh, perhaps a little <coughs> of the details of that text there. Do we notice, of course, first of all, just very briefly, uh, verse number 3, that when it comes to the unity of the church, uh, we do notice, of course, that that is a unity and that we're just repeating what others have said. I'm not going to tell you anything new about verse number three, but I really need to see it just on the surface there. Unity is not something that I make. It's not something that you make. It's something that we keep. You notice that. Verse three, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's God who makes the unity. It's the Spirit of God who makes the unity. Uh, just as you and I uh, individually are connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, so too the Spirit of God brings us together. So we keep it, we don't make it, and that's, that's good, because I couldn't make a unity like that. Only God can. All I have to do is to keep it. And of course we have the three keys for keeping that unity in Ephesians chapter number 4. We have, of course, love, and that runs from verse 2 right the way down. Yeah, we did mention that in the previous evening, I think, with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. And peace, verse number three, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And thirdly, of course, grace, verse number seven. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the Spirit of Christ. Now, as you look at that unity there, <coughs> from verses uh, four down to verse six, uh, you will notice, of course, that this is a unity that is divinely inspired. A unity that's divinely inspired. Why the church? Why do we have a church? Why bother? Why does God have a church? I mean, he didn't always have a church, did he? Why, why does God not work uh, in the way that he worked in the book of Genesis? Why doesn't God just work on an individual basis. You remember that he called Abraham, and it doesn't seem back in the book of Genesis that there was much more than Abraham. God just had his individuals. And then, uh, out of the blue, appears Melchizedek, another individual. Individuals that are isolated, uh, but no obvious connection between them. But God was moving in their hearts. Why does God not work like that? Well, you know, I'm, I, I'm a free person, and you're a free person, and we'll just go on being free people and connected with God. Why have a church? Uh, why not move in families? That's what he did with Jacob, wasn't it? He's, he moved in a family. Or maybe, why not just have a nation? That, that, that fulfills much of the Old Testament scripture. Why does God not just do that that way, as he did with Israel? Why have a church? Why have people brought together in unity, saved by grace, filled by the Spirit, meeting together, worshipping together, uh, sharing together, being taught together, in testimony together. Why is that important? Well, the cause of it lies in the very heart of God. Let me take you back to John's Gospel. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Here's why church. John 17, 22. Here's why church. Here's why we're all part of one big thing. John 17, verse 22. Prayer of the Lord Jesus. The glory which thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. You see, the church, in a sense, is inevitable. The church is essential. 
because the church is a continuation and a reflection of divine character. God is unity. The unity of the Spirit with the Son, with the Father. The unity of the Trinity. It is an essential feature of deity. Unity. Unity. And of course, as you look through the, the work of God, in, particularly in the Gospels, you will find so often that unity. If I was to ask you, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? You could go to the text there, uh, Romans 1, is the Spirit of God. You'll find also that he's raised by God the Father. And you'll, you'll find that I lay down my life and, and I'll take it again. He's raised by himself. There's that unity in, in everything that is done. And in Ephesians chapter number 4, as you look at the church, it's marked by the divine unity. The unity of the church in Ephesians 4 is sevenfold. Just like that unity of the sevenfold spirit of Revelation chapter number 1. There is a sevenfold unity. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4, there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. A sevenfold unity. Just as God himself is marked by a sevenfold unity, so too the church is marked by a sevenfold unity. Not only that, but if you were to look at those three, those three verses, verses 4, 5, and 6, you would find that that sevenfold unity is divided up into three threes. Now you see the maths don't work with that. <laughs> but they do if you look at it very carefully. Three threes. It's a triple trinity of unity. Verse number four. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling. There's your first trinity of unities. Verse five. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's your second trinity of unities. And verse six. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. There's your second, the third trinity of unities. And so this church that we're part of is marked by trinity of unity, trinity of unity, trinity of unity, and a sevenfold unity. It's a reflection of the very character of God. But they may be one, even as we are one. And so this church is not only a testimony a constant reminder to Satan that his days are numbered, they're coming to an end, that God is, Christ is building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But it is also a constant testimony to the reality of the unity of God, of Christ himself. Now, in these verses too, we, we do get a little glimpse, don't we, of the certainty of the outcome of this great work of the church. There's something interesting at the end there, verses 8, 9, and 10. It's just that little echo of what we were reading about at the beginning in 2 Samuel, that in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, let me just highlight it, the certainty of our faith, the certainty of our salvation, verse number 8. In the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour does two things here, or highlight, uh, verse 8 highlights two things, that he both ascends up on high and... Uh, not only did he ascend, verse 9, but he also descended first. So there's, there's an interesting little echo that we have here, that there's a pattern in the work of the Lord Jesus. We have a saviour who came from heaven to earth, and then from earth to heaven. And the reason that's in the chapter number 4 is because that is an echo of something that God is about to do. That Christ, in a sense, touches both earth and heaven because... He is going to fill all things. Verse number 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all things, above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So the fact that in the past the Lord Jesus Christ was both in heaven and on earth was just a little taste of what was about to come. Be sensitive to it. That the Saviour who's in heaven will fill heaven. That the Saviour who touched earth and was rejected and despised and crucified, spat upon, whipped and mocked, is the same saviour who'll fill this place. He'll fill everything. We've got a little echo of it in Christ. And the evidence that he will fulfill that which he has promised is his church. A church that he's established, a church that he maintains, a church that grows, and a church in which he's present and worshipped, a church that is his body, that is his bride, and that is his temple, his building. And that is the living testimony to the fact that one day Christ will fulfill that which he's promised. That as he has touched heaven and earth, he will fill all things. And that God's will will be fulfilled as he has said. Let's pray.
Our Father, we do come into thy presence. We thank thee, our Father, that thou art the God who declares the end from the the beginning, and that which thou hast said will come to pass. And we thank thee, our Father, for that. We thank thee, our Father, for a Saviour who came from heaven to earth. And we know, our Father, that as we read the Gospels and we see, our Father, the way in which he was treated, and we read the prophecies, he was despised and rejected. We remember, our Father, that they put him outside the city. They found the most despicable place for him. And we remember, our Father, he was met by false accusation, by hatred, by spittle and by violence. And yet we remember, our Father, that he is the same one to whom has been given all authority in heaven and in earth. And he will fill all things. We thank thee, our Father, that we can see that little movement on the mulberry trees in a sense uh, this evening. That that which is about to be fulfilled, that great battle and victory that is about to be won, we see the evidence of it right before us. That the Saviour has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that is indeed what he is doing. We thank the Our Father for that. We thank the Our Father that in the midst of the battle uh, and, the, and the attack, that there is this great strength that is given to us. The strength of the foundation as we go down into the truth of the word of God, the apostles and prophets. The strength of unity with one another. And the strength our Father upwards in our relationship with Christ. And we pray, our Father, that we might indeed enjoy that day by day. And that we might, our fact, be, our Father, be, be marked by, by that strength, consistent. A strength, our Father, that reflects the glory of God and the unity of God. And we pray, Father, that we might indeed live for thy glory. And as we do so, uh, make an impact on the world round about, seeing others coming to know the Saviour. So be with us, our Father. Bless the word of God. There's much in it that's very practicable. Some things are difficult, but we thank thee, our Father, that there's much that's practicable and very encouraging. As we offer thanks, our Father, praying for thy blessing upon